So Costco this week opened in China to a literally overwhelming response. I'm going to be talking about that. Philip Morris and Altria are in talks of merging with each other. These are the two tobacco giants, and they're planning on merging each other. I'm going to share my opinion on that. A viewer, one of the viewers here, sent me an email with his detailed plans of how he plans to use hundreds of thousands of dollars of leverage in a dividend growth portfolio. So you're going to see my response to that. And then, of course, we have M1 Spend. I was able to snag access to the beta, so I'll be showing you a little bit of that and what it looks like. So stick around. Got a lot to go over in this video. All right, so first of all, I won't keep you waiting. I'll go ahead and show you M1 Spend first. For those of you who are not familiar with what it is, M1 is, they're doing more than just be, being an investment platform. They wanna be your one-stop area for all your financial needs. Part of that is they need to come up with banking functionality, which is what they're doing, which is, is pretty much checking functionality, and that's M1 Spend. So I was able to get uh, beta access to it. So this is what it looks like. You guys won't be able to have access to this right now. Um, but they're going to be rolling it out for everybody. I'm, I, I don't know the exact date. I can't tell you exactly when they're going to roll it out for everybody, but I think it's pretty soon. I think in the upcoming weeks, you're going to be hearing more announcements about it. But just initial impressions, I think this looks really good. I mean, I'm interested to hear your guys' opinion, but it looks super clean, really intuitive. It shows you your total balance, the interest rate, cash back rate. Uh, you have the transactions here. This is where the history will show up. Obviously, I haven't been able to use it because if I go to the debit card screen here, and I click on this, my card needs to be activated. So I requested the card today, and it says that it's gonna take a week to get to me, like five days or so. So I'll be able to start charging to this card, and I'll be able to show you what the transaction history looks like maybe sometime late next week. But um, I'll go ahead and go over a few of the features here. So there's the transactions tab, the debit card tab that I've already shown you. The last one here, direct deposit, I would click on this. It has just a really nice interface. It tells you your account number and routing number for your checking account. And that's really all it tells you. So it has a thing where you can like copy it to your clipboard. And that way, if you wanna hook up your works direct deposit with your HR, you can do that really easily there. And then your money will start being deposited right into M1 Spend. Now, of course, there's, you know, there's a lot of conversation and talk about the interest rate and the cash back because there's all these other competing companies right now. And to get these two rewards, you have to have the M1 Plus. Uh, I'm not gonna cover that whole area right now. I'm not gonna do a whole review on this right now until I've actually had time to use the product and be able to give you an idea of what I think of it more in depth. So right now it's just an initial impressions, which like most things that they've made, I think they make it look really, really good. I just really am a fan of the interface. I think it's actually a big deal when it comes to this stuff. It makes it easier to look at your investments, makes it easier to manage your finance. So I really like that aspect of it. But a couple more buttons here. You have a deposit and withdraw. These work just like how you think they would. You can put in the number here, check the account that you want it to go from, check the account that you want it to go to. Really simple. If you want to set up recurring, you can add that in and, and it has all sorts of different options, including bi-weekly for people that have bi-weekly paychecks. So lots of different flexibility there with your deposit schedule. You can make it so that this moves money into your investment account every single time you get paid. So uh, that's what I recommend to a lot of people, like to family members, is to totally automate their deposits, make it so that money is always going to their investment account before you really even receive it in your checking account. So that way you don't have an opportunity to spend it. But but pretty cool stuff there. The other thing I wanted to show, and this is something that everybody should have access to right now, is the transfers tab. So M1 Spend, like I said, is in beta. I have more uh, kind of like an exclusive access to it right now, but it will be rolled out to more people in the upcoming weeks, I assume. And right now, though, everybody has access to this transfers tab. This is a new interface they built for managing all your different transactions. So it has your upcoming ones, your recurring schedules, it has a summary of all your accounts. So I have more money here because I have my Roth IRA included in this. But then I have my invest accounts, spend, borrow. You can see a summary of it all here. You can see that I transferred $2,000 into my M1 spend account. So that's what I'm going to kick the tires with, use that $2,000 and start using the checking functionality with it. And then they have this big button here that, again, you can move money around in every way possible. So really easy to use. I like the interface. I like the design of it. I'm excited to use some of the tools. Uh, but to get like an in-depth review where I think I can actually give it justice as to the value of it and my thoughts more in depth on it, I'm going to leave that for a later date when I actually have time to, to use the product more in depth. So anyway, wanted to share that with you guys. Let me know what you think of it. I'm interested to know. I'll go ahead and jump to some news now. All right. So the first piece of news I want to talk about is Costco. And 
It's interesting because Costco does not make the news that often. This is a company that stays out of the news. They're not, they're, they don't have a lot of controversy. They don't have a lot of screw ups, but they made the news this week because they opened up some stores in China and the reception to it was so overwhelming that the stores became so overcrowded that they had to shut them down early. Now, I don't know how familiar all of you are with my channel. There's a lot of people that are new here. We've gained like a thousand subscribers just from the last video I did. So we're having a lot of new people here, but I've only made a handful of videos and two of them have gone pretty in depth in Costco. One of them is called Investing in Costco and it's 25 minutes, literally just about Costco just this company. And the thumbnail, I say it's the best business model ever. Pretty bold claim. I've looked at a lot of companies, looked at a lot of different business models. I truly think that that's the case. Costco has the best business model ever. Try to think of another company. I, I challenge you, think of another company that has been able to balance the roles of returning excellent value to consumers, treating their employees way above industry standards. I mean, they treat their employees so much better than the competitors, it's not even funny. And they give investors a great return on their investment. What other company has been able to balance all of those roles as good as Costco? I don't think that one exists. Costco has a business model of offering goods at extremely low margin rate and shaving off a little bit of profit with a membership fee. So it's a pretty incre incredible business model that they have. Now, having said all of that, obviously I'm a huge fan of Costco. I love the store. I'm a... a not only a consumer of it, but I'm a shareholder of it and I like it in both ways. I like being a shareholder of it, I like being a consumer of it. But I'm also American, right? And we all have our different cultures, we all prefer different things at different parts of the world. But as you're about to see in this video, uh, China also loves, at least seems to love, giant warehouses full of at cost consumer goods. Let me go ahead and play just a few seconds of video caught here and look how many thousands of people are completely packed into this warehouse. There's thousands and thousands of people in it. They can't even move their carts around. There's so many, it's so congested. In there. And by the way, every one of these people in order to even shop in here, they have to be, they have to be membership holders. So they're paying at a minimum $60 a year to this warehouse. Even if they don't buy anything or they don't really use it today, Costco is getting all those yearly memberships and Costco has an extremely good retention rate. So uh, it's no surprise that this made Costco stock go up this week. It made the stock go up like, I don't know, five or 6% this week. So uh, investors like seeing that. And let me show a few more pictures here. So we have one here of somebody holding a sign here. It has the Chinese and then it has the English translation of it saying, the parking lot is full, it takes three hours to wait. There's more pictures, this showed up on Twitter. Look at this line. This line goes down the street just to get into a warehouse. Now, my local Costco, I mean, on a Saturday morning, it's busy, like it's pretty dang busy. You know, you might have to park far away from the warehouse or whatever, but it's not like this. I can just walk into the warehouse. I've never seen anything like this, this busy. Of course, this is its opening, so, it won't be like this year round, hopefully. Otherwise, I don't think people would enjoy shopping there. But uh, this is a good sign. Having this kind of reception for Costco is a really good thing. You can see, I mean, that's so busy. So many people. Now, on the same subject, uh, I have to mention this. There's Costco. This is being uh, posted on Reddit, and this is all over different social media. You can find the same thing on Twitter. Um, the post says, Long Costco, first store open in China, three-hour wait to get parking space, had to shut down after five hours to avoid stampede accidents. So they shut down the store early because when there's groups of people like that, uh, I mean, it just people are weird when they get in huge groups. They can literally trample over each other. So um, they shut it down so that hopefully nothing like that would happen. Nobody would get hurt. If I scroll down here, this is one of the comments. Chinese propaganda, short, easy. 32 points, meaning 32 different people upvoted this, right? And then another person replies to it saying, the pre-printed sign in the middle post ready on the first day is a strong indicator. You are correct. So they're suggesting that this is Chinese propaganda. And the motive they're saying China has to do this is to show how powerful their consumer is to America's companies. And 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 that way we want to do business with them, right? Um, so they think that China is putting together this propaganda and making it so that uh, they're, they're pretty much, they're faking all of this to show how powerful the consumer is. And that way they can put more pressure on Trump in these trade negotiations. Now, a lot of people actually agree with this. I mean, this is a lot of people upvoting this. They think that China's doing this as some sort of propaganda. Um, 
I, I don't think so. I, just my opinion. I don't think China is using Costco as propaganda to show how strong their consumer is. I think that people like Costco and I think it's just a human experience to go in there and to be wowed by walls of merchandise. That's something everybody likes. It's not just, it's not Americans that like being consumers. I'm sorry. You, I, I think Costco will work in Canada. I think it will work in Europe. People like buying stuff. It's just an experience to go in there and see how much stuff they have to buy. Right. So that's my opinion on it. I don't know. I wouldn't put it past to China to potentially do something like this. I'm not suggesting that the country's government is honest by any means. I just think that this is a long ways to go to do something very specific that I don't think would have much of an impact on the end. But there you have it. Reddit are always big on the conspiracy theories. You can find these things online. Don't actually agree with this one, but I'll, I'll let you know as this develops further. All right, so moving on from Costco, I want to talk about the, this other news here. Philip Morris and Altria are two of the, they're the, like two of the biggest iconic dividend paying companies in existence. These companies have both paid dividends for a very long time. Now they're both tobacco companies. They're both under those sin stocks, right? They, they sell tobacco and related products. They're trying to acquire like e-cigarette companies and marijuana companies and, and that type of product. Now, I don't own either of these, which is odd for a dividend growth investor. These typically have been two of the biggest, longest growing dividend growth companies in existence. I still, I, I never plan on owning them. Now, this isn't a moral thing. I don't really care if people smoke at all. Now, having said that, the last time that I talked about these companies, I gave some reasons of why I don't invest in them. And I got some pushback on that, uh, which I do on a lot of things on, on my videos. But I wanted to go through one of the comments because it laid out, I think, a pretty strong argument against what I said. I like to go through different people's arguments about what I'm saying and respond to them. So this one's from Zeng22. I think he's commented a few times on my videos, but he says, I got to disagree with you on sin stocks. They make the two most addictive chemicals in human history, nicotine and ethanol. Same with casino companies, which prey on gambling's addictive nature. They're not going anywhere. And people are less health conscious than you think. Why has obesity been exploding if everyone is shifting away from unhealthy habits and products? Why have companies like McDonald's and Yum! Brands making money hand over fist year after year with no signs of slowing down? Besides, cigarettes companies are slowly acquiring stakes in marijuana companies. When federal legalization of marijuana is reality, Altria and Philip Morris will be the first to hit the market with profitable marijuana products, not these unprofitable tiny weed startups. All right, Zang, so I appreciate the comment. You bring up, I think, some fair points, but I wanna go through a couple of these here. First of all, you say they're not going anywhere, as if that's a, a matter of fact. These companies aren't going anywhere and people are less health conscious than you think. Now, on the they're not going anywhere part, I wanna talk about that for a minute here. Here's from the CDC. Cigarette smoking among US adults lowest ever recorded 14% in 2017 the lowest ever recorded. If I go over to CNBC here, tobacco stocks tumble as cigarette sales decline. Cigarette volumes fell 11.2% in four week period ending March 8, according to Nelson data published Tuesday. The core product that these two companies sell, tobacco, has been on a decline for about 15 years. Just as, just as a whole, tobacco has been on a 15 year decline. The core product of these companies, the most profitable part of their company is on a decline year over year. And that decline is not expected to stop. So when you say they're not going anywhere, they might stick around, but they're certainly shrinking. These companies, their main core product is shrinking. And of course you mentioned that they're expanding, right? They're, they're taking on these new uh, products. They're, they're trying to invest in e-cigarettes. They're trying to invest in marijuana, but that's not because they're just expanding their business and you know, they're, they're trying to grow their empire. That's because they're having to move away from their core business model. They know that tobacco is shrinking. So they're bringing on other products in hopes to just stay even. Um, that's point number one. I don't like investing in companies where their core business model is, is declining and they're having to change their business model to something else. I like companies like the one I just mentioned, Costco, where their core business model is so good, they don't have to change it. All they have to do is just let other people know about it. Just open up new storefronts, open up new markets. Tobacco isn't that, it is on a decline. And you mentioned these other products, marijuana, 
that's one of them. They're also moving into the e-cigarettes. And like I said, I don't really think that e-cigarettes are going to be treated all that different than just normal cigarettes. If you look at a lot of reports coming out, here's one from the Wall Street Journal. Teen vaping has created addicts with few treatment options. That's not good press right there. This is reminding me just of how tobacco, uh, you know, the the media came out against it and then the government came out against it, prevented it from being advertised and campaigned against it. And pretty much they're killing off tobacco is what they did. So whether it's a justified target or not, I don't like investing in a product that the government seems to be totally against. You have other reports like this. This is from CNBC. The FDA is investigating 127 reports of seizures after vaping. So I don't care if people vape or do whatever they want, but if I'm going to put money into a company, I want it to be in a company that the government is not trying to squash, a, gu- a company that the government wants to help, right? That they want to incentivize growth and stuff. So these companies, they have the government against them. They have health officials against them. I just think they have a lot of an uphill battle. They have a lot of bad press going against it. So this all, all goes into that first point. Now, another point I wanted to bring up on this whole uh, tobacco company thing is let's take a look at my consumer pie here. This is where these companies would go. They make consumer products. I have Costco, which I shop at frequently. Target, which I shop at frequently. Disney, which I consume their content and I have been to Disneyland with my kids. Products I use, services I use. Home Depot, again, I'm a, a shopper of Home Depot. Nike, I own lots of their products. Comcast, that's I have their internet hooked up to my house right now. Coca-Cola, I buy their juices and their products all the time. Estee Lauder, my wife has a whole makeup drawer full of their stuff. And then Texas Roadhouse, uh, another restaurant that I go to semi-frequently. Every single company I own in my consumer pie are companies that I use, that I enjoy the, the products that I make. I'm not suggesting that everything you enjoy using is a great investment. But what I'm saying is I feel more comfortable investing in companies that I personally use. If you're the type of person that you're really into e-cigarettes or you're really into marijuana, it's part of your interests, you've done a lot more research on those companies, you might be able to make better investment choices in it. I don't use the products. I have no interest in them. I just see that they have a lot of bad media attention, that they have a lot of bad government uh, attention, that their overall sales on their core products are declining, and it just doesn't create any interest. All those factors added together don't create any interest with me. So I don't care. People can invest in those. I don't think that they're going to go away tomorrow. I mean, these these companies are going to be around for a very long time. So in that way, they're not going to go away. But I personally don't see a really great future with them. I think there's other companies that I, I like their business model and their strategy a lot more that I also enjoy their products. So I'm going to put my money in those companies. All right, so let's get to some questions here. The email is josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com. josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com. You guys can send me emails at any time. Message me on Instagram or Twitter. That works as well. Now, uh, this is the one that I teased in the intro. I get a lot of emails, but I don't get many like this. This is from someone named Jonathan. He says, hey, love the show. Got a question I'd like to hear your thoughts around. The short story. I like to elaborate on leveraging my dividend portfolio like a lot. I'm in the process of doing so, and I'd like to know if you have any thoughts of why I shouldn't if I can get a loan with a fixed rate that's much lower than my dividend yield. The long story. I've had my portfolio for a while. It's well diversified and gives me a dividend yield of around 5 to 5.5% 5 a year. Most companies have a long history of not cutting the dividend, so I'd say that my dividend yield is somewhere safe. I have no plans of ever selling my portfolio, even at the lowest of a recession. I don't need the money, so my plan is to borrow somewhere around 100000 to 500000 USD to increase my value of my portfolio. I know I can borrow this at around a rate of one and a half to two and a half fixed interest for 10 years at different institutes than where I have my portfolio. So that's a really low interest rate, one and a half to two percent. So I don't always get in that interest rate, but that's really low. He says, this way I can never get a margin call as long as I'm able to pay my interest. So however much the value of my portfolio de- decreases in upcoming bear markets, I never have to sell it off. I can ride it out. My portfolio's dividend yield shouldn't come even close to that interest I'm paying, even if some companies cut dividends and my dividend yield decreases a little. The only risk I can see is if my 10-year fixed rate expires and interest rates now all of a sudden are higher than my portfolio dividend yield at the exact same time. Uh, We are in a bear market where my portfolio has lost some value. 
then I have to pay off my loan and I might have to cut a loss. But then I've still got 10 years of leverage dividends and let's be real, will this really happen? Maybe I can get the fixed rate for 15 or 20 years. Don't focus on how or where I can get this rate, just assume that I can. I realize that there's always risk with leveraging, but from what I can see, the risk is small compared to the upside. Let me know where I'm wrong. All right, so Jonathan, would I go ahead and recommend to someone that they take out hundreds of thousands of dollars of loaned money from some institution and use that money to invest in a dividend portfolio? Uh, no, I wouldn't recommend that. This one's kind of tough though, because the interest rate that you're citing which seems totally fictitious to me because it's 1.5% to 2%. Uh, I don't know where you can get money that cheap. That is such cheap money. Even my, my home mortgage, which I, I got at a really low time. I mean, interest rates are so low right now. That's more than one and a half to 2%. That's totally collateralized money right there. So I don't know where you're getting this one and a half to 2%. That might change it a little bit because that that's such cheap money that you're getting there. But even so, the risk reward profile just isn't there for me. If you have a, a 2% interest rate and your dividend stocks are earning five to five and a half percent per year, uh, you're just taking on so much risk for that 3%. I just don't think it's worth it. The idea of just losing and being out, being in some situation where you owe somebody else $100,000, that would be so destructive, it takes so long to pay back. I, I'd rather just wait and invest with my own money. With my own portfolio, I don't owe anybody else any money. The only money that I could possibly lose in the stock market is money that I have to lose. I can't lose anybody else's money or owe anybody else in it. So uh, I, I feel a lot safer doing that. I personally am not a huge fan of, of using leverage in this situation, especially where the market is right now where things are, are a little bit expensive. Maybe if we were right after a recession, maybe if the S&P 500, the PE ratio of companies was way lower and you know somewhere around 2010. If we could go back in time to 2010 and look at the, the situation there, sure, you can use some leverage and, and get some good deals. I don't think it's the right time to take on this, this type of leverage, this type of risk. Uh, even with that low of an interest rate, I don't think the risk reward profile is there. Now, I will say, Jonathan, I'm not recommending that you go ahead with your plan, but if you do, I, I uh, am definitely interested in watching the results from a distance. So let me know how it goes and I'll go ahead and share it with my audience what happens with this. So keep me updated if you do intend on going forward with this and I'll let everybody else see how it turns out. I think it'd be interesting to see. All right, so the next one's a, a comment from Kind K. He says, Joseph, really enjoy your videos. However, it would appear that you are already very wealthy as it seems you've invested $20,000 in your portfolio in six months. He goes on, he says, you spend almost all of your video time talking about stocks, but only 60% of your portfolio is in equities, 40% is in REITs and bonds to which you talk almost never about. Shouldn't you be like 90% equities? You're only invested in dividends as you have pointed out, dividends drop a lot less than stocks prices during recessions and downturns. Following your strategy outside of the US is impossible. Fees and charges are too high and buying all U.S. stocks would incur additional FX exchange fees. Superstar fund manager Terry Smith has dismissed dividend income investing as folly. I would like to see your rebuttal to Terry Smith's arguments. Anyway, keep up the good, keep up the good videos, but viewers outside of the U.S., it's infuriating as an impossible strategy to follow. Okay, so I'll go ahead and go through these one by one. Um, First of all, the part I'm very wealthy as it seems I've invested $20,000 in a portfolio in six months. Uh, my investment schedule hasn't changed that much over the past two years. One of the things that has changed is that last year I, I still owed money on different things. I owed money on cars um, as well as some other loans that I paid off. So uh, that cash flow that normally was going to those type of things, I'm able to put in my portfolio and I've been pretty stringent on our budget. So my wife can tell you about that. We, we really work aggressively to budget. So a lot of people might not see that, but that is the hardest part about investing. I say that every single time is being able to budget, being able to make it work. I know not, not everybody's going to be able to put in a couple thousand dollars a month, right? Everybody's putting in different uh, amounts of money. Whether that's wealthy or not, I think it's pretty good. But at the same time, I get messages all the time. Every week I get messages of people that are younger than me that have much more money than me. I'm turning 30 in like a, a couple weeks. And, you know, my portfolio is 50,000. 
uh, that's not exactly ultra wealthy to have a $50,000 portfolio when you're 30. At the same time, there's people that are in their, their 50s that don't have anything saved. So this is all relative. Uh, this is wealthy to some people. It's poor to others. You know, it's really, it's so relative, but I'm putting as much money as I can. I work really hard for my money. I feel like I work around the clock, so I'm not going to apologize for being able to put in as much money as I can. Um, I'm trying to help motivate other people to do the same because it starts to build up after a while. Now, moving on to these other parts, you say you spend almost all of your video time talking about stocks, but only 60% of your portfolio is in equities. 40% is in REITs and bonds of which you talk almost never about. A lot of this comment shows me that you haven't watched any of my previous videos. I have a video dedicated to REITs, an entire video about it, the whole sector, where I go through every single REIT that I hold and talk in depth about why I purchased all of those REITs. Um, I talk multiple videos about bonds, but there's not that much to say about them. They're all ETFs. I'm not going to go in depth about them. I mean, there's just an ETF of corporate bonds and then some treasuries. So, uh, you know, there's not too much to talk about that. Bonds don't do a whole lot. As far as being 90% equities, why do I have to be 90% in equities? We're at an 11 year of the growth of the market. My portfolio has done very well over the past year. I just posted that on Twitter, the performance of my portfolio against the S&P 500 over a lot of different date ranges. You say in the next part, following your strategy outside of the US is impossible. Fees and charges are too high and buying all U.S. stocks would incur additional FX charges. Uh, so this one, I think, is probably the most valid point that you bring up. For European investors and Canadian investors, it's difficult because uh, we're kind of spoiled here in the U.S. We have tools like Robinhood and M1 Finance that make it so trades are free. So when you're buying uh, new shares with dividends and stuff, you don't have to pay those trade fees. Uh, but having said that, I know that it's not impossible to invest in dividend strategy in Europe. It, you just have to implement it a bit differently. What a lot of people I know do is they, they take a month's worth of dividend and income, they gather all together, and at the end of every month, they, they pick out of like a group of 10 different companies which one they want to put the money into. So they group it all up into one purchase, and that way it diminishes a lot of fees associated with it. Um, I'm not saying you have to buy all U.S. stocks. I've never told people to go ahead and buy every single holding that I have in my portfolio. I give it as reference. I show what I'm invested in because a lot of this channel is being transparent. So I'm showing where I'm putting my money. I'd rather you not buy all the same companies I have. If you know lots of good dividend paying companies in Europe and lots of companies that would fit within the, the strategy and the metrics and the ideas, you can purchase those, those European companies. If I was European, and I was uh, more familiar with the brands there and the, the different products that they offer, I would own a lot more European companies. I've said in previous videos that the reason that I don't is mostly because of ignorance, because I'm more exposed to American companies living here. So that's the single biggest reason I don't own a lot of European companies. The next thing you say, superstar fund manager Terry Smith has dismissed dividend income as folly. Uh, I Okay, yeah. I could go in and see the different reasons he has. Um, I, I'm honestly not too familiar with, with Terry Smith. There's other investors that are also superstars. Look at Peter Lynch that says that dividends are such an important metric in companies that you could make that you can't go wrong making a portfolio based purely off of companies that have paid dividends for 10 or 20 years. And Peter Lynch, you know, he's a, a legendary investor. So you have different opinions there. There's investors that love dividends that are great investors and there's investors that don't like them, like Terry Smith. I'm not saying Terry Smith is wrong or that his arguments are, are wrong, but there's a lot of ways to make money in the stock market, right? On this note, if you're interested in where I addressed arguments that I'm sure are the same arguments that this guy has made towards them, go to a video called Dividend Haters, My Response. It goes through in depth the same arguments uh, that a lot of these people bring up about dividends. So uh, as far as the you wanting to see the rebuttal to Terry Smith's arguments, go watch the video entitled Dividend Haters that I have right in my video history. If it's not addressed there, tell me the specific arguments he has that I don't address in that video. And then the last one you say, it's, it's tough for viewers outside of the US to follow. 
I get the frustration there. Again, I, I think that this is the most valid criticism you have. I wish the M1 Finance was available outside of the US. I know Robinhood is finally getting to a point where it's big enough where it's going to start moving into Europe. So you already have brokers that are free, completely free trades that are going to be moving to Europe. I think that Europe has a little bit higher taxes with dividends. So maybe it's not the most optimal strategy. I'm not saying that it is. But uh, I think there will be more opportunities in the future to make dividend investing work for Europeans as well. So I'd be interested to know what other Europeans think of this. If it really is impossible to invest with any company that disperses capital through dividends or if there's ways to implement the strategy, because I can't imagine there's no way to make dividend investing and work in Europe. Uh, in the U.S., it's such a big strategy. It's such a staple that so many people do that so many people depend on that it just is weird to me that it would there's no conceivable way it would work in Europe. All right, guys, I'm going to have to end it there. If you want your questions on the show, josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com. Uh, be sure to follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button. Also, in case you didn't know, this, uh, this podcast video, whatever you want to call this thing, this show is on YouTube, of course, but it's also on all the podcast platforms. It's on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, all that stuff. So anyway, I'll catch you guys next time. You have a good one.